James Hunt's body was broken after a nasty wreck. A person in his condition should be in the hospital, but in his case, James was kicked out for partying naked with a sex worker in his bed. A struggling Formula 3 driver, James Hunt had just lost his sponsorship and had no prospects on the horizon. His dreams of being a Formula 1 driver seemed further away today than when he began just five years before. He sulked in disappointment, smoking joint after joint and treating his cotton mouth with swigs of beer. Maybe everybody was right. Maybe he should just quit. But Hunt's not really the quitting type. Quite the opposite, in fact. He may have been the most determined driver on the planet. James Hunt was worthy of the cliche of having a larger-than-life personality. Well, now, James, they've changed the regulations concerning the air boxes and the wings, and yet you're still extremely fast. How do you do it? Big balls. <laughs> there wasn't an emotion Hunt didn't indulge. Joy, anger, love, jealousy, fear, rage. His charm was that he wore them all on his sleeve. James, how much does this victory mean to you? Nine points, $20,000, and a lot of happiness. Combine that with traditionally handsome looks and an exhilarating driving style, and you have the ingredients to make an icon. That's what James Hunt was. Women wanted him and men wanted to be him. Authentic and edgy in a stuffy British society, Hunt was a nonconformist who didn't try too hard. If we were alive during the internet, he'd have more memes than Grand Prix victories. How, how remarkable. Yeah. Could you give me a cigarette? Can I grab that cigarette off you? Thanks. He wasn't the best driver in the world, and he wasn't the best person in the world, but he sure was memorable. Today on Past Gas, after discovering racing so late in life, could James Hunt keep up with more experienced driving prospects? Was Hunt a good driver or just a fearless daredevil with a lot of luck? Would the drugs he took to cope with the danger in his career actually hold him back? James Hunt lived large, drove fast, and died young. And today, we're telling his story. Fast Gas Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about forts. Sounds like a pretty randy lad, baby. <laughs> Austin Powers was based on him, yeah? Really? Uh-huh, yeah. Because, like, uh, in 1997, I think, he... I think he died before that. Uh, yeah, but he showed up again. Right. Because he, he got was... in a time machine. <laughs> yeah, he was uh, defrosted. Oh, yeah, he was defrosted. So, right, right, yeah. right, right, right. The technology they have for that is crazy. Like, you're, like, frozen stiff. And then they put you in this like big kind of like toaster and uh -huh. then they turn it up to like six or seven. And, but it's really important. They got to hit the defrost button. Uh huh. Otherwise it's not going to thaw you out all the way. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and like, there was like this funny story where like when he reclaimed all of his items, there was like a penis enlarger. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but the Walt Disney company was like, Hey, actually we own the trademark on freezing and unfreezing people. So they shot him in the head. Well, I don't remember this mm -hmm. from the movie at all. That's unbelievable. It's not in the movie. It's real life. <laughs> okay. So the same year that James Hunt was unfrozen, they made Austin Powers. Is what you're saying? Coincidentally. Yeah. 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 It was oh, like a side to throw the trail off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And by coincidentally, I mean C coincidence CIA. <laughs> it was an op, dude. I'm really trying to shake my fearless daredevil image this year. Yeah. You're trying to shake it? People think of me as a fearless daredevil. Yeah. I've, seen you, and I, I've seen you do some sketchy that, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like a lot to keep this image going uh -huh. and I want to be that guy all the time where people are just like, Oh, you're that fearless daredevil dude from donut. And I don't know. Why don't you just do something? And I don't know what to do <laughs> most of the time. Yeah. It's like when people <laughs> ask James to tell a joke. Yeah. It'd be funny. Yeah. Uh huh. And I nail it 100% of the time, but I'm annoyed. Mm -hmm. Just like Joe, when people are like, Hey, do something. You're like, I guess I'll jump over this gulch. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm your dancing monkey. I guess I'll uh do a backflip on my BMX bike. Yeah. It's annoying. Yeah. <sighs>
Uh, well, if you see me in public, don't don't make us do stuff. We're, okay? we're recording this on Earth Day, which apparently is a national holiday. It's also a holiday for our company because we're sustainable. Sustainable. No one else has to work, and we do, so we're in a good mood. Other YouTube channels they shoot on tape, and then they they <laughs> burn the tape and release yeah, all the chemicals after every shoot. Mm-hmm. We use I, uh, we, we write everything on papyrus. All of our videos <laughs> papyrus. are printed. Papyrus. Well, how did you make that sound disgusting? <laughs> all of our videos are recorded on 100 percent up- upcycled papyrus. Yeah, and we write in papyrus <laughs> font as well. Just to keep the theme. This is Past Gas, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Uh, if you're a returning listener, thank you very much. If this is your first episode, welcome. Welcome to Past Gas. Haven't said welcome in a long time, uh, but thank you for being here. I'm your host, Nolan Sykes, joined as always by my co hosts. We got Joe Weber, hey, Daredevil, keep Joe Weber, juiced. and James Pumphrey. Oh, hello there. Welcome to the show. And this week we are talking about the subject of a little movie you might have seen called uh, Drive. What is that movie? Is it Drive? No, <laughs> no, it's Rush. Rush. Thank you. <laughs> it's been a while since Austin I watched. Powers. <laughs> yeah, Austin Powers. Uh, Rush. You might have seen it a few years ago. The Ron, Ron Howard movie about James Hunt and Nikki Lauda. We are talking about James Hunt. We've already talked about Nikki Lauda previously. And now we're going to tell James's story. Can't wait to get into it. Uh, you guys have been asking for this guy for a long time, and he's quite the figure. Speaking of CIA ops, uh, this episode is about a guy named James. Yeah. Written by a guy named James. Oh, my God. Co-hosted <sighs> by a guy named James. Whoa. That's three James. That's crazy. Follow, follow the money. That's a triumvirate right there, dude. I'm sunburnt and my arms hurt. <laughs> yeah, I forgot to put. We went out to uh, uh, Apple Valley Speedway yesterday. I did not put enough sunscreen on my face. My nose is very oh, red. No. Uh, my hands got sunburned somehow. Because the because uh, your hands are on the driver the wheel. Yeah, and they're being magnified so, through the the windscreen. I guess so yeah, we were out there shooting uh, the new season of High Low. This is gonna be a. We have the Z's again. We're V8 uh, we, swapping the Z's. That's we right. We have a 525 horsepower LS3 crate engine going into high car. Uh, next week or the week after, Nolan's going to the junkyard to pull <laughs> that's right. uh, LS4 low car. LQ9, I think. Is that the Six, iron block? I believe so. Six liter. You already know where it is? We have an idea. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's a good uh, tagline you already know where it is you already know where it is <laughs> uh but but yeah we uh low car is 100 percent blown up yeah. high car as of yesterday was 80 percent blown up and then we definitely blew it up yesterday yeah i think we broke it even more but i was surprised it basically survived we did a lot of thrashing on it it wasn't running super well but it was enough to get uh, a lot of footage and is the engine the only thing that's uh broken or is it transmission no, it right? doesn't have any power steering anymore we woo yeah the power steering broke uh something feels very weird in the rear end of that car uh-huh um, yeah it's either like an axle or the diff or something something something's weird in there so we should definitely give that a give that a look when it's back in the shop um but yeah i'm super excited to to film more of that uh that's all we filmed so far as of now, but uh, I'm really looking forward to it and for you guys to watch it and for us to learn how to do a little bit of sideways driving. So look out for High Low Season 2.7.1. You already know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do this. Yeah, let's do it. James Hunt was born August 29th, 1947 in Surrey, England. And for some reason, he was really pissed off. Quote, he was an odd little fellow, a rebel right from the moment he was born. He was endlessly restless, punched himself right out my belly, he did. Oh, Says Sue Hunt, James's mother. Hunt's parents were both suburbanites. His father was a stockbroker and his mother came from industrialists. Ooh, this boy was rich. His parents tried to run a pretty tight ship at home and it was obvious that Hunt had little tolerance for their rules. 
Since he lived before the time of ADHD medication, a 10-year-old Hunt had to find alternate ways to cope with the constant energy bouncing around his body. So, he started smoking cigarettes and fighting other children. <laughs> I can relate. The latter of the two he really enjoyed, which is saying a lot. Since at his peak, he smoked 60 heaters a day. Oh my apparently. God, three packs? That's crazy. That's a lot. His mom was so fed up with the fighting that after breaking his hand in a tussle, she made him take the bus by himself to the hospital to teach him a lesson. It would prove futile as he'd get in a fight a few days later. <laughs> this guy likes to fight. This was an early indicator of a personality trait that would follow Hunt his entire life. A trait once described by his friend, John Richardson, as, quote, a complete single-mindedness and ruthless determination. I don't know if I'd call constantly getting in fights ruthless determination, but... Back then, getting in fights was a lot more romantic than it is now. <laughs> getting in fights now, like, is a lot more realistic than it used to be. Like, if you're like, yeah, Nolan always gets in fights. And you're like, oh, he just, like ruins his shirt and gets scratched yeah, up, gets and slapped up a couple times and then pulled away. I do feel like fighting, uh, the, the scraps you see online on the internet now are like people like literally trying to kill each other. Uh huh. And maybe back then it was less trying to kill each other and more just trying to like rough each other up. I think it was different for sure. Yeah. Just keep my wife's name out of your fucking mouth. <laughs> <laughs> His parents tried everything to keep him preoccupied. He did well at sports, but didn't play well with others. What a surprise. So team sports were out. He was good at tennis and skiing, but they couldn't hold his interest for long. Then at 15 years old, while on holiday at a farm in Wales, Hunt came across something that would alter the trajectory of his life on this planet. He discovered a tractor. <laughs> As we all do. Yeah, we've all been there. Hunt was obsessed with the huge piece of industrial equipment. He begged the farm's manager to teach him all about the gears and wheels. He learned how to drive it and fix basic mechanical issues. He spent his entire holiday working on that tractor. Like his mother said, he was a little odd fellow. Driving that tractor made Hunt yearn for a driver's license. Once he got it at 17, his love for driving and the freedom it brought him swelled. At the time, the Mini League was very popular. Amateur drivers would race old-school Mini Coopers at the track. Hunt went to watch one night and was instantly enthralled. He couldn't sit still. He couldn't sit still as he sat there imagining himself behind the wheel. There was something waking up deep in the pit of Hunt's body, down where the DNA lives. <laughs> <laughs> DNA lives everywhere. <laughs> it's the point. It lives everywhere on your body. Hunt decided he was going to be a race car driver. I think we've all had that moment where we realize like how cool it is. Well, yeah. Anytime I get to do like uh fast driving, I'm like, Oh yeah, this is what, this is what I like. Like yesterday. Yeah. But even before that, when you're little and you realize that like things that have wheels can get you places faster, even if it's mm -hmm. a bike or a skateboard or something that makes you mobile and you're like, Oh, I'm not stuck at my house all day like i can go ride my bike somewhere yeah. or take a little cart well somewhere. even beyond like like that's such a fun race car thing. driving realizing that it's possible to do a thing that you might want to do is like a huge moment i remember yeah. the moment that i decided like i want to be funny <laughs> really uh, yeah for my birthday i went to like see um happy gilmore in the theater with my friends yeah nice. and i didn't know what it was <laughs> um, I think like my dad chose it and he was like, this is the time we're going. And I remember he was like at the beginning of the movie when he was drinking soup and he was like, sorry, daddy. I was like, that's so, <laughs> I was like, that's so fucking funny. This guy is like so dumb. <laughs> and, he's, and I was like, he's probably so rich. <laughs> that's what and I want to do. Correct. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to be funny. How old were you? Like second or third grade. That's fun. Mm -hmm. When I was three, my parents, we drove past a farm and I was in the back seat and just to myself, like my sister overheard me. So I was like, look, pigs. And then like I muttered to myself, they don't make them like they used to. <laughs> <laughs> and that. James Hunt worked odd jobs and saved up enough money 
uh, to buy into Formula Ford, a common entry level step into the world of single seat open wheel racing. Wait a minute. What? Yeah. Like, why are we acting like this dude's dad was a stockbroker and his yeah. mom came from, quote, industrialist. Industrialist. That means that she, her family like, owned factories. <laughs> uh, yeah. If you're mad at smog testing or the RPM act or anything, blame people like James Hunt's mom. Yeah. When Birmingham, you literally couldn't see 30 feet ahead of you because of the smog. Yeah, they were like, oh, we know what to do with all these old tires. <laughs> we'll burn <Yeah>. them. <laughs> we'll burn the tires to light the coal, to burn the coal, <laughs> to heat the kerosene, to make the kerosene steam, to twist the turbine that's yeah. made out of slaves. <laughs> oh, God. I love being an industrialist. Industrialist. <laughs> its participants uh, ranged from enthusiasts and amateurs to career-minded drivers. It was the perfect place for Hunt to learn. James was all gas and no brakes. Shout out Andrew Callahan. He was fearless, and as a result, he wrecked a lot. A whole lot. Uh, while in Formula Ford, it's estimated that Hunt crashed 50 times. Jeez. This earned him the nickname... Hunt the shunt. Shunt was a popular British racing term for crash at the time. Uh, that is also telling of like, if you're really scraping together to put together a car, mm -hmm. you're a little bit more careful with it. Yep. Oh, if yeah, you're like totally. crashing all the time, it doesn't matter. You just go get another car. Yeah. Like you wouldn't have the opportunity to crash 50 times. No, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> In his worst crash up to that point, Hunt flew off the track and into a lake. Oh, wow. He was quickly eaten by Nessie. <laughs> <laughs> this accident was a turning point. His nerves made him routinely retch and vomit before races. On the outside, Hunt was aggressive and defiant. On the inside, he was a ball of anxiety. Sounds like a lot of comics. I'm just basing everything I know off Twitter. People that I follow. On the inside, he was a ball of anxiety. He had zero patience for other drivers. Uh, if anybody made a mistake in a race, Hunt was quick to throw hands. He fought drivers, crew members, teammates, and even cold clocked an official one time. That's Damn. cool. This guy That's sounds so like cool. such a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. Even in the rowdy era of the 70s, Hunt the Shunt was earning a reputation for throwing fists. Hey, you know this rich guy that crashes all the time and punches everybody <laughs> yeah. yeah he <laughs> fucked my wife <laughs> god he was so cool <laughs> that guy's awesome <laughs> this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp online therapy life can be overwhelming and so many people are burnt out without even knowing it symptoms can include a lack of motivation feeling helpless or trapped detachment fatigue and more for me, working from home is kind of bittersweet because I love interacting with my coworkers and I've kind of been denied that for the last couple of years, which has led to, you know, a little bit of burnout. You guys can probably relate. Doesn't matter what industry you're in, burnout is a real thing with work. It happens to everyone and it's not something we got to be ashamed about. It's something you have to recognize in yourself before it gets too bad. You have to prioritize yourself which means getting help when you need it. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. I think everyone should go to therapy, and I think BetterHelp is the best option out there for anyone who's new to therapy. It's so easy, it's convenient. You don't have to go into a building if you don't want to, you don't have to see anyone on camera. You can be vulnerable. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and PassCast by Donut Media listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash PassCast. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P.com slash PassCast. Thanks, BetterHelp. Big thanks to every plate for sponsoring PassCast. Dinner can sometimes be a big pain in the butt. Sometimes I don't want to go to the grocery store. That's why every plate is so cool. Every plate is America's best value meal kit. Every plate helps you skip the tedious trips to the grocery store and delivers everything you need to cook consistently affordable and delicious meals. Choose from 17 weekly recipes and then, well, sit back. They'll deliver pre-portioned ingredients and easy to follow recipe cards right to your door. Are you tired of eating the same plate of chicken and rice on repeat? 
Every plate offers a wide range of mouth-watering meat, seafood, veggie options, and more. Plus, you can swap out proteins, veggies, and sides for your liking. Think about it. Less time in the kitchen means more time watching the game, and more money in your pocket means more to spend on concerts or your car or whatever you have your eye on. I've done meal services before, and nothing is as affordable as every plate. Plus, the options they give you are amazing. I like a variety of different meats and veggies, and every plate has that in spades. It's very affordable, and it's just as delicious. Try every plate for just $1.79 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering code GAS179. Get started with every plate for just $1.79 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering code GAS179. While his anger didn't make him a ton of friends off track, on the track it helped him occasionally win races. That got him an invitation to move up and join the minor league of Formula One, also known as Formula Three. At 22 years old, James Hunt was now a professional race car driver. Formula Three was littered with talented prospects. These were healthy young drivers who began racing at an early age and were deemed the future of Grand Prix. Wealthy young drivers. Yeah. I say healthy. You did say healthy. I thought that was we can, weird. We can keep going. I think that's healthy. Funny. Healthy works too. I was like, huh. I mean, I guess they probably were. <laughs> <laughs> they dressed rich, went to private schools, and knew royalty. Hunt regularly wore jeans and a t shirt. He sometimes washed, most times not. Ugh. While his fellow drivers were out practicing or working on their side businesses, Hunt was most likely drunk at a pub playing pool, often, for some reason, with no pants on. <laughs> cool. What? That's the coolest part about him so far. Nobody believed Hunt had a <laughs> chance. But his risky style could sometimes work in his favor. He found himself having consistent top five finishes. By the time the 1969 nice season was over... Hunt had gone from a complete unknown to winning a Grovewood Award as one of the three most promising young drivers in the country. Hunt's pre-race vomiting intensified after he witnessed another fatal accident. It would make perfect sense for Hunt to alter his driving style after all the carnage he'd already seen on the track. But if Hunt was interested in making sense, he wouldn't have picked a career where on average two people die every season. He thought driving aggressive was the best chance he had to win. On the other hand, you can't win if you don't finish. Finishing events was becoming a challenge. At one point, Hunt the Shunt had really ugly crashes in back-to-back -back races. In one, his car landed on top of another driver's arm, breaking Ooh. it in three places. The following week, he flipped his car to 100 miles per hour and slid across the cement. He ripped the skin off his hands down to his bones while also fracturing his vertebrae and completely tearing two muscles in his back. Oh my God. Meat crayon style. Ow. It was after this second death-defying crash that James Hunt decided to indulge in a fatalistic view of his time on Earth. He started to believe that he would die young in a car, and the best thing he could do was to accept it. Hunt, while recalling the moment, said, quote, Racing drivers never talk amongst themselves about death. But one night in Sweden, I discussed it with Nick Lauda. We came to a practical rather than some philosophical conclusion. Because of the game we had chosen, there really was no point in leaving the celebrations till later. Chances were pretty high that we both get killed. Something in the way. <laughs> I am vengeance. I am vengeance. Hunt became a walking celebration with a definite dark side. After recovering from the brutal accident that mangled his hands, Hunt came back in his first race and finished strong. After the difficult recovery, this was the boost his morale needed. That is, until his friend Lauda moved directly up to Formula One. Ooh, then it made him angry and punch people. Yeah. <laughs> he punched 19 guys. <laughs> <laughs> this is how you get into Formula One. <laughs> Hunt couldn't hide his jealousy towards his friend Nicky, who had bought his way onto the circuit. Hunt had resentment towards his old flatmate and knew deep down that his team couldn't financially compete with Lauda. Hunt's equipment was not only inferior in aerodynamics and speed, 
but there are some days where the damn car wouldn't even start. But a shitty car is still a car. At least he had one to drive, or so he thought. Mid-season, without warning, he was fired by the team, March, and replaced. It's never been fully clear why he was fired mid-season, but the expense of Rex probably had something to do with it, and the fact that he punched guys all the time. He was told by March's executives that he could drive one more race, and then perhaps he should give up on driving and get a job instead. Hunt agreed to do that final race and dominated the entire time, driving himself straight onto another team. Lord Alexander Hesketh, owner of the most British name ever contrived, was a 22-year-old chief whip in the House of Lords. <laughs> sounds like could be like a secretary, but it's so British that it sounds <laughs> yeah. amazing. Chief whip in the House of Lords yeah. means like, yeah, he's like rich, but like he also has to drink everyone else's pee. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, it's a job. It's from like the olden days. This is a weird episode, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> We've had a long week. Yeah, Nolan and I woke up at 5 a.m. yesterday. And then last night, I j- looked at the last text I sent. It was at like 3 a.m. After becoming bored of counting his endless piles of inherited money, he decided to buy a car racing company. He called it Hesketh. He saw Hunt drive his final race for the March team and requested a meeting. He was instantly smitten with Hunt's confidence, pecs, defiant attitude. Hunt had gone from <laughs> Hunt had gone from unemployed to employed in less than 24 hours. Now as a driver with Hesketh, Hunt fell back into one of his worst habits, wrecking cars, punching people. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh drinking. Uh, (laughs) womanizing (laughs) womanizing Uh, Hunt wrecked so often with Hesketh that he once got into a bad accident while driving home from a race in which he didn't finish because he was in a wreck (laughs) oh my god dude just pay attention (laughs) (laughs) this was before phones too yeah yeah totally what he did um if I got in a wreck in a race, I'd be like, can someone drive me home? Yeah, <laughs> yeah for real. absolutely. I think I'm done with this activity for the day. <laughs> uh, Hesketh couldn't financially keep up with the piles of twisted steel that Hunt was creating every week. They couldn't afford a car anymore. So after barely getting started, their Formula 3 days were numbered. James was again without a car. He had gone from unemployed to employed to unemployed again in just a few weeks. On top of that, he sustained significant injuries in the crash uh, he got into on the way home after the other crash that he got into on the track. And he was kicked out of the hospital and uh, forced to recover at his home. It's hard to imagine what a severely injured person would have to do in order to get kicked out of a hospital. In this case, it would appear the line that was crossed was doing drugs with a naked sex worker in your hospital bed. That'll do it. In the movie, they made that seem way cooler. Yeah. And it wasn't it a nurse in the movie. It wasn't like a yeah, and the sex nurse worker. was like a really attractive nurse. And he like had one little cut on his rib and he's like, oh, I'm going to pull the curtain. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But like this guy like was doing like <laughs> meth with like. Yeah. <laughs> a lady. They really romanticized it. What a sad dude. Like, can you imagine what he was like? Like, just to himself late at night. I gotta drink more water. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. Just, just, like, smoking two packs of cigarettes from 9 o'clock three. to, like, 3 in the morning. Oh, yeah, 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 I know, but he had already smoked a pack earlier that day. But Yeah, he smokes a pack in front of everybody and then, like, yeah. two to himself. Oh, God, 40 cigarettes, 60 cigarettes in one day is crazy. Also, this is pre-internet. So, like, getting a sex worker to the hospital... Yeah. Was like hard. Sex worker had to be home and he had to have memorized <laughs> the number. Yeah. Or he knows the number to like the pay phone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this guy's a bummer, dude. Bedridden with broken bones and a concussion, Hunt was forced to evaluate his mostly unsuccessful years in Formula 3 and nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't see a clear path forward of how he could move up to Formula One. That's when an idea struck him. He would call the March executives 
and accused them of unfairly terminating him. Nice. Yeah. Great, great move. This guy rules. He would threaten to sue them yep. unless they supplied him with a new car okay. and paid his way into Formula 2. And if nice. that didn't work, he would ask them if they knew his father. Dude, his dad gave him this idea and paid for it. Or like his mom did. It's like, you know what you should do, Jimmy? You should sue them. To the surprise of probably every person in his life, uh, it worked. March agreed. They had fired him unfairly and gave him what he asked for. Hunt's single-mindedness and ruthless determination got him what he wanted yet again. Couldn't race his way to Formula 2. He'd use the next best tactic. Being a rich piece of shit. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you can tell uh, the writer is trying to sugarcoat it a little bit. But he's definitely not like as... Romantic as uh, Hemsworth portrays him. I mean, I I know Chris, I know Chrissy Hemsworth, and he, you know that he goes by Chrissy. Yeah, I mean, I'm friends with Liam through Miley. <laughs> that was weird, but yeah, I mean, a Chrissy Hemsworth, James Hunt is not. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> Well, now that Hesketh had a functional car from March and and Hunt's wounds had fully healed, it was time to get back to doing what he loved most. No, not drinking expensive scotch while sleeping with 35 British Airways stewardesses over an entire weekend in a Tokyo hotel, although, according to common legend, he did that also, but more appropriately, to pursue his lifelong dream of winning a Formula One championship. Wait, they claim that he slept with 30 women in like two days? Yeah, and they're all stewardesses. His dick would be ruined. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I didn't think of that. His dick would hurt so bad. He'd be so tired. You know he's not drinking water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's definitely not uh, yeah, hitting those water goals. Yeah, by like the 22nd woman, she grabs him and he just like recoils and he's like, oh, too tender. <laughs> <laughs> This promotion to Formula 2 elevated his status and gave a bigger audience an opportunity to get a look at arguably the most aggressive, unpredictable, and dangerous driver in all of racing. Hunt did not disappoint. He put on a show every race, taking risks that no other driver would dare do. Similar to Formula 3, this led to one of two conclusions, either a top five finish or a mangled car. Lord Hesketh didn't care about the shunts. He didn't care about the money. He was already bored in Formula 2. The minor leagues were for minor leaguers. He was a major leaguer. His name is Lord Hesketh. He's a whip. He's a whip. He whips up the votes. So Hesketh decided to go all in on supporting Hunt and giving him whatever resources he needed in order to make him a Formula 1 driver by 1974. The Hesketh racing team was the biggest joke in motorsports in 1974. (laughs) <laughs> i love that turn first you had a 22 year old owner born into obscene wealth has gets 22 yeah oh my God. in the movie he looks 47 <laughs> uh Hesketh would routinely show up to races aboard the biggest yachts in europe then there was an engineering team that was basically a bunch of cast off from lower level teams who probably drank too much to be working on a race car Finally, there was the driver, James Hunt, the man who did cocaine before races, had sex with his fans, and had more trips to the hospital than first place finishes. Brutal. All right, hot take here. Okay. Okay. I think James Hunt was a virgin. Really? Doth protest too much. Doth do protesteth mucho. I don't think he was a virgin. (laughs) <laughs> no no but he's definitely yeah this guy there's too much it's too much mm-hmm. do less S- yes like i'm on the hesketh racing team uh website uh-huh. right now yeah hesketh racing.co.uk okay they fucking suck <laughs> <laughs> is a uh, little lord falterai still around hesketh? uh he might be dead But like, it's like all these like shitty looking dudes who like now would 
like they all own board apes <laughs> <laughs> and like the Lord Hesketh on motor racing. This is a quote. The establishment didn't take us seriously at all. It's like, mother, you are the establishment. You, you are a fucking whip in the House of Lords. Yeah. And you're 22 and you own a racing team with zero merit at all. Nothing just chaps my enough. ass more than rich guys that think they're, they need to prove a point and go against the system. Yeah. Rich guys who think they're mavericks. Yeah. Well, there's also like this, this r- smells of a rich guy who, who, uh, you know, I mean, he's obviously not as rich as the other rich guys in Formula One. Because, I mean, at this time, an all-time in Formula One, like. Or he's richer and just worse at it. Maybe. That's a possibility. No, no. Yeah, yeah. Like, I think he is potentially richer. Just his team is worse. And just the establishment. It's like, dude, you're in Formula One. Lord Hesketh became a baron when he was age four. Whoa. I kind of like that bear logo, though. I know. I might buy some merch. <laughs> <laughs> that bear logo is sick. I know. I might get a tattoo. <laughs> Fuck, they have jewelry. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Dude, I'm going to buy a... <laughs> I'm going to buy some James Hunt. This is why... <laughs> this is why rich guys always win. Mm-hmm. In 1974, the shunt was turned loose on the world's premier Grand Prix Racing League, Formula One, and they did a lot better than anybody expected. Did James wreck a lot? Of course he did. Did he blow his engine a few times? Also, yes. Still, he had a surprising three top three finishes and finished the season with 15 points. Not really sure where that puts him. <laughs> It would take him a year and a half, but on June 22nd, 1975, in the Netherlands, at Zandvoort, it finally happened. Hunt and his team of outcasts at Hesketh won their first Formula One race. The victory tasted even sweeter because they beat Grand Prix's fastest rising star and Hunt's friend, Nicky Lauda. This race was a foreshadowing of things to come between Hunt and Lauda. The rest of 1975 saw Hunt have two more second place finishes and finish the season in fourth place. Not too bad. Lauda won the championship that season, but Hunt was the story. This hard partying, free living playboy who puked his guts out before every race just finished fourth place in Formula One. James Hunt was here to stay. George Russell is like boring James Hunt. (laughs) But as often happens for those who test their luck, Hunt's luck finally failed. The Hesketh Racing Company collapsed. The venture had been horribly mismanaged, losing more money than even the ultra wealthy Hesketh could afford. So with only two months until the start of the 1976 season, uh, by the way, that's the year that America was born. James Hunt was again without a car, whether it's fate or dumb luck, Hunt seemed to constantly be a beneficiary of it. McLaren's Champion driver Emerson Fittipaldi, you ever heard of him, had just quit. And McLaren needed a replacement immediately. Enter Hunt, stage right. (laughs) (laughs) McLaren signed him. He was coming off a good year and had promised, but most importantly, he was affordable. British journalist Mike Duden claimed Hunt was so focused going into 1976 that... If you offer James Hunt a world championship point for running over his granny. (laughs) He would get into his car and do it without (laughs) hesitation. Got me. Got me in the second part. (laughs) With McLaren and their main sponsor, Marlboro Cigarettes, uh, Hunt had the resources he always wanted. He had the team, the car, and a company with a lot of money. However, unlike Hesketh, McLaren wasn't interested in a let's have some fun out there approach. Hunt knew that McLaren wanted a return on their investment. So he gave up partying except for Sunday through Wednesday nights on a race week. And for him, this was a true sacrifice. Honestly, who wants to party on a Tuesday? Races on Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. So you party that day. After the race, you start partying. Yeah, that's the big party day. Monday, that's Saturday to you. Yeah. 
Sunday's your Friday. Yeah. Monday's your Saturday. Mm-hmm. Tuesday, the nurses Tuesday. are off. Tuesday, the nurses yeah. are off. That's your Sunday. Yeah. Uh, and then you yeah. are an F1 driver that drives for McLaren, so you deserve a three-day weekend. Yeah. That's Wednesday. <laughs> and that's when the garbage ladies are off. <laughs> Garbage ladies are coming. <laughs> <laughs> They're the the garbage ladies are fun. This episode is brought to you by Truebill. Do you know why free trials renew without your consent? It's a business scam out to get you. Don't let greedy corporations pocket your money. Download Truebill to take control of your subscription. You know, I think ever since 2020, I've signed up for a lot more streaming platforms than I really need to, and then I kind of forget about them. And then I'm like, why am I spending like $60 on streaming things? And it turns out that I have like three services I don't use. Truebill can help you with that problem. Truebill is a new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people save up to 720 bucks a year with Truebill. Because companies make subscriptions hard to cancel, Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap. And your Truebill concierge is there when you need them to cancel unwanted subscriptions so you don't have to. I love Truebill, they save me money. I use Truebill and you should too. Truebill has over 2 million users and helped them save over $100 million. Like Matthew B. Take it from Matthew B. Who says, quote, In a matter of seconds, I saved 660 bucks a year on my DirecTV bill, saved $120 for the year on my SiriusXM bill, and saved $840 a year on car insurance. Don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash gas. Go right now. Truebill.com slash gas. It could save you thousands a year. Truebill.com slash gas. This episode is brought to you by Policy Genius. Why get life insurance? If someone relies on you financially, a child, a parent, or even a business partner, life insurance gives you peace of mind that they have a financial cushion if something happens to you. Policy Genius is your one stop shop to find the insurance you need at the right price. Head to policygenius.com to get started. In minutes, you can compare personalized quotes from top companies to find your lowest price. You could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. The licensed agents at Policy Genius are on hand through the entire process to help you understand your options and make decisions with confidence. The Policy Genius team works for you, not the insurance companies. Also, Policy Genius doesn't add on extra fees and they don't sell your info to third parties. I think Policy Genius is the best option for selecting a life insurance policy. Policy Genius has thousands of five star reviews across Google and Trustpilot. They also have options that offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. And since 2014, Policy Genius has helped over 30 million people shop for insurance and placed over $150 billion in coverage. So head on over to policygenius.com to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. Policy Genius. In the first race of the year, Hunt didn't finish after taking a corner too hard and wrecking. He watched on as defending champion Nicky Lauda dominated the race. Lauda and his Ferrari team looked to be in peak form and ready to win another championship. In week two, Hunt came out and finished second to Lauda in South Africa. (laughs) However, Lauda already had two first place finishes in two races. Hunt already felt way behind. Hunt would take first place just ahead of Lauda in Spain. Shockingly, after the race, he was disqualified for a wide car. <laughs> what? Oh, I remember this part of the movie. They bring out the <laughs> yeah. yard stick, the meter stick. Lauda was like the original um, Proust. Yeah, he's a little, uh, a little. Drove for Ferrari. Rat. But I mean, mm. maybe that's just part of Ferrari's legacy. I don't know. I think like it's unfair to like when uh, people bag on Max or any other driver for being like whiny in the car when like you hear like one clip from a race weekend. It's like all these guys are like posh rich guys who have been racing their whole life. You don't think they're always. I don't I don't bag on the drivers for what they say, but like the principles I'll shit on. That's fair. I'll bag on Max any day. You see him complain about stuff and then do the exact same thing. I know, but you're in the moment, man. How cranky are we right now? Exactly. I shoot YouTube videos and I'm like a baby. 
<laughs> like my job is so easy. I don't have to get into anything. I'm like, oh man, I drove around race car track yesterday in a bunch of funk cars. I'm so tired. Like <laughs> I'm a baby. <laughs> Those guys' job is like actually hard. They have to work out. Yeah. They have to eat well and work yeah. out. We should start working out our necks like they do. <laughs> yeah. like the okay. event. Just get fat. Yeah, yeah, let's get thick necks, yeah. big butts, but and skinny like, arms. St- stop using our arms yeah. all together. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that's a good video. I trained like a an F1 driver for a yeah. year and it ruined my life. <laughs> I have to buy it. Two airplane seats now because my butt is so muscular. <laughs> That's hilarious. Shockingly, after that race, he was disqualified for a wide car. This gave loud of the win. A few weeks later, after further review, they decided to reverse the disqualification. Hmm. The controversial call gave Hunt the victory after all. At the halfway mark of the season, after a victory in France, like we did on D-Day... Hunt had two wins. Lauda already had five and had yet to finish worse than third all year. In a bizarre turn of events, Hunt would again find himself disqualified for mechanical reasons after winning the British Grand Prix. The first place prize would go to Lauda. Dude, Lauda's having a great season. However, this time the disqualification would be upheld. It was clear the two best drivers that season were Hunt and Lauda. Their styles couldn't have been more different. Hunt was all body and Lauda was all brain. It was pure (laughs) instinct. It was calculation. It was a rush to the finish line. On a rainy day at the Grand Prix's most dangerous track, the Nürburgring, Hunt and Lauda were battling for first place. Suddenly, Lauda's car malfunctioned and he lost control. Why do I have to always read all the sad stuff? I mean, it's... (laughs) In every script, we got to stop joking for like a couple paragraphs. <laughs> I know, but I feel like I read every I know, you sad do. thing. It's like totally luck of the draw. It's like Nolan like starts it every time. Mm-hmm. And then it's like. It is kind of weird. I'm mostly here for color. Yeah, but you also. <laughs> yeah, like, like, somehow I'm like, I think historically then, you do. Then, you have done like 80% of like the, the <laughs> yeah, deaths and crashes weird. in this in this show. Yeah. Then one day in 1992. Ayrton Senna. <laughs> yeah, you did that one. You did uh, Earnhardt. Earnhardt. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I did Schumacher. Is right. Oh, my God. You probably did the Dunlop family, too. <laughs> every every mm-hmm. one that died in there. <laughs> yeah, I did, uh, what's his name? Ken Miles. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Carol Shelby. I announced all the deaths. You have a dramatic cadence. Though. It's not on purpose, Joe. Yeah. It's not. No, I know, but I, I'm ha- happy that you do it because no one. What, Joe? I'm just saying, dude. I just hope it's a final destination thing. And because I have to deal with death so much in these scripts. Yeah. You'll all die before me. No, don't. Yeah. yeah. I want you to go first. <laughs> no, I do. You know how superstitious I am. <laughs> I don't care. I'm superstitious <laughs> too. I just started getting sweaty palms right now. I 100% want all my friends to die before me. 1,000. Before I'll you? Be, yeah. Why? Because I want to live for a long time. Okay, fair. But that but doesn't, you can, you can wish for a long life without wishing death on everyone else. <laughs> I'm not wishing death on you. I'm wishing more life on myself. Okay. We're all going to die, Joe. Newsflash. Deal with it. Grow up. I'd want to die first. You'd want to die first? I don't want to see other people die. Good. One less. <laughs> you can have that. <laughs> Great. Thank you. I mean, sure. That's what I wish for every birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be the last one left. Anyway, suddenly Lauda's car mail functioned and he lost control. He went through the rails and his car erupted into flames. Race was stopped as drivers and medics rushed to pull Lauda out of the inferno. He was rushed to the hospital on the brink of death. The doctors were able to save his life, but he'd need weeks to recover. Yeah, his lungs were like charred up. I mean, we've talked about this in uh, a previous podcast about Nikki Lauda, and then uh, we've done some videos on our YouTube channel about it. Like, yeah, definitely go check those it's out. It's bad. Yeah. It was like 80 seconds in the car or something like mm-hmm. that. Jesus. 
like his like eyelids burnt off. After winning in Germany and with Lauda out, this was uh, an opportunity for Hunt to catch up in the points. And that's exactly what he did. He won in both the Netherlands and Canada. He was now within striking distance of Lauda, who had decided, despite his injuries, to return to the track. They fought back and forth in America, with Hunt finishing first again and Lauda second. Hunt was now only down three points. This set the stage for a dramatic final race of this season in Japan. <laughs> The conditions uh, on the rainy track in Japan were abysmal. They were eerily similar to that race in Germany at the Nürburgring where Lauda uh, had his tragic wreck and almost died. And despite protests from the drivers, the officials decided to move forward with the race. But Lauda refused to do it. You know, being caught on fire yeah. uh, taught him a lesson that he never forget and decided not to ignore he graciously withdrew from the race in japan giving hunt the win uh later hunt would call out of the the bravest man i'd ever met for sticking by his convictions and exiting such an important race this meant if hunt finished third or better he'd be champion came in third place moving him in front of lauda by one point james hunt sucks bro Deep down, Hunt didn't feel like the championship should have been his alone. He proposed sharing it with Lauda, but Lauda declined. He believed Hunt deserved the sole claim to the title. He said, James is one hell of a driver. <laughs> I have to say that I had the best car, but he drove incredibly well towards the end. That was really good. Yeah. It was an impression. You got the like teeth in there. That's like a big part of the impression is getting that, the big teeth. It was the it was like an impression of the guy from the movie. Yeah. yeah. But that dude did a great impression. What's his name? Daniel Brule. Daniel Brule. He'd probably be pissed if you told him he was doing an impression. <laughs> I wasn't doing an impression. <laughs> I was acting. <laughs> like, what's the difference? What's the difference? <laughs> I studied Meisner. I studied Meisner. I made everybody call me Nikki. <laughs> After the most focused season of his career ended in a championship, Hunt started celebrating and never really stopped. It took a massive toll on his driving. He didn't win his first event in 1970. He didn't win his first event in 1977 until the 10th race. He had eight did not finishes because of crashes or mechanical malfunctions. One disqualification occurred because Hunt was so drunk he passed out in his car on the first lap. Oh my god! What? That's crazy. I mean, at, at this point, this is a serious problem. Yeah, that's not good, so. man. His <laughs> yeah, man. Hunt's friend Ronnie Peterson was in the midst of an incredible season and was fighting with Mario Andretti for the championship. Dude, this is the year after he won the drivers' championship, and he passes out in his car. Yeah, that's bad, man. During the race, because he was hammered. It was in 1978 that Hunt lost his love for racing. Then tragedy struck in a way that even Hunt couldn't handle. Hunt's friend, Ronnie Peterson, was in the midst of an incredible season and was fighting with Mario Andretti for the championship heading into the Italian Grand Prix in Monza. During a tricky maneuver on the first turn, Hunt clipped Peterson's car sending him flying into the barriers and bursting into flames. Hunt was the first one to get to Peterson, pulling him out of the fire and dragging him onto the track. Peterson's legs were mangled with compound fractures protruding through charred skin. He couldn't overcome the injuries and died. Hunt was done. 1979 would be his final season. Hunt's last season was a boozy blur and he quit after seven races. His heart just wasn't in it. He couldn't find the joy to drive any longer. When asked later about his retirement, Hunt answered, quote, It was over. I felt no sadness at all. Just immense relief. But he still loved the sport and accepted a job as a commentator for the BBC, where he would become even more popular. He regularly polished off two bottles of wine during a race, giving fans a refreshing and uninhibited commentary on the sport. For as long as he could remember, Hunt had a feeling he would die young. 
Once he made it to his 40s, he felt like he had beaten back the Grim Reaper. He was a father now. He was ready to start a new chapter with a special woman named Helen Dyson. On June 14th, 1993, he proposed to Helen and asked her to marry him, and she said yes. That night, he went to bed feeling like the happiest man in the world. However, he'd never wake up again. He suffered a massive heart attack in his sleep right next to the woman whom he had hoped to grow old with. He was just 45. James Hunt was one of the most colorful figures in the history of Grand Prix racing. At a time when racing was rarely televised, he managed to become a massively famous figure in Great Britain. He was a race car driver, a rock star, and Austin Powers folded into one person. His legendary partying and antics provide endless stories that are still told in racing circles to this day. Hunt's persona aside, he was also a really exciting driver. He got a late start to driving, so he was never as polished as some of the more experienced people on the grid. He had to overcompensate by swallowing his fear and pulling moves other drivers would find too risky. His 1976 championship season was Hunt at his absolute best. It's no surprise that it was also him at his most focused. So the big question surrounding Hunt's legacy still lingers. If he hadn't chosen to indulge in so many of his vices, what could he have accomplished? I think I think if he didn't do racing, he'd probably be the head of a corporation that dumps uh, a bunch of chemicals into the ocean. Huh. Perhaps maybe the uh, the drinking and drug use was a way. To, uh, maybe his um, his devil may care attitude did make him just a better driver after all. I don't know. Yeah, I think you need some sort of like that a little nugget of uh, psychopath in you to take those chances. But he wasn't like a psycho, like, let's not romanticize him that much. Like, he's probably like pretty good at driving, like, obviously, like very good at driving. But like, if you watch Rush, like Nikki Lauda is definitely the villain. And like James Hunt winning that season is definitely like who you're like rooting for. Yeah. And they like change the narrative. So it's like, yeah, dude had like a prostitute in his like hotel or his like hospital room or whatever. Like doing drugs, like that's sad. Like he passed out from drinking, like in a Formula One race. Yeah, that's really like sad and fucked up. Like just to- this guy's not very cool, and the, like the way that they present him, like in the movie, is like just like fucking a right. Yeah, you want to be this like, dude, right? Fucking a like that ugly guy who got all burnt up, like didn't win. Like that's tight, but and like ever like whenever you tell the story of James Hunt too, like there's always a quote from Nikki Lauda. Yeah. That's like, actually, he's like really good guy. <laughs> yeah. You know, like actually James Hunt isn't a piece of shit. He deserved to win that year. And like, it's not because like I didn't compete in most of the races. <laughs> yeah. He don't get me wrong. It. When I said he was a psychopath, I wasn't saying that in a good way. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I'm not romanticizing but like, I think, like, psychopath. Yeah. This guy is just like, fuck James Hunt. Like, I I think that that's a new thing about me. Fuck James Hunt. Fuck, fuck uh, Henry Ford. Fuck James Hunt. Yeah. We're probably going to um, p- piss off a lot of people who requested this episode, but that's the harsh truth. He's not. Mm-hmm. We shouldn't be romanticizing people like this because. If you don't like Jake Paul, then you're not allowed to like James Hunt because James Hunt is exponentially worse. Yeah. If you don't like Jake Dan Paul. Bolzerian. You uh, can't root for uh, wow. James Hunt. That's worse. Joe went there, dude. Joe went there. Damn, dude. What? You guys don't like Dan Blitzerian? Uh, I, I mean, I don't. I mean, he's at my house. <laughs> <laughs> he's uh, right off camera, Joe. Oh, uh, shit. You're lucky I have these headphones on. Uh, he can't hear you. No, he's polishing his AK-47 right now. Damn it. Yeah, James Hunt's a piece of shit. Fuck James Hunt. Thanks for listening to Pat's Game. <laughs> We got some fan mail. We do. Matthew Mathieu writes, I've been a fan of Donut Media for a long time and listen to Pass Gas every day in my way to work, to and from work. All in all, I think the podcast is the best and it makes my commute much more enjoyable. Thank you, Nolan, Joe, James, and all the writers, producers, and editors who helped make this podcast possible. I will always be a lifetime listener and Donut Media fan. You guys always ask for criticism, but truly I have nothing bad to say, except 
I think Nolan needs a catchphrase. I think you do too. All right, uh, let's try some out. Um, do you, thank you, Matt, too. Uh, keep it juiced. No, dude. You know what? I'm gifting you this. You okay. can you can take you. What is it? You already know where it is. Yes. Yeah, it's yours now. You already know where it is. Oh, it feels That's good. That's really good. That yeah. feels nice. That's Thanks, really Joe. Good. Wow, what a what a bookend for the episode. Oh, you know what? Also, your other catchphrase is big fruit. Big fruit. <laughs> big fruit. You already know where you it is. You already know where it is. <laughs> Thank you, Matthew, for the kind words. If That's you'd really like good. to uh, send us whatever, uh, hit us up at pastgas at donutmedia.com. No, I mean, we should say criticism or, you know, words, letters, don't send us anything. I say criticism because I don't want to just read nice things and make it sound like we're kissing our own ass on our own show. No, you said yeah, don't anything. Oh. We don't want to get like a, a oh, head yeah, don't, in a box. Don't send. Yeah. Yeah. Don't send a head. Um, all right. Follow the boys at Joe G. Weber at James Pumphrey. Follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. Big thanks to our producers this week. As always, Gavin Kinzel and Thomas Ouellette. And our writer this week, James Mastriani. What a story. James Hunt. All right. Peace out. You already know where it is.